Humble welcome to my old friend, colleague, batchmate from all the way from University of Iowa. We finished our PhDs together, Professor Anur Kumar, who did his PhD in 2008 with me, but I was in religious studies, he was in journalism, so so delighted to see him after many years. And uh, except for, uh, thank you, Anu, for accepting my request to come and share your long, uh, <laughs> we used to discuss so much and you have so much to share. I always welcome your, uh, your wisdom, your insights. So today, Professor Anu Kumar uh, is joining us all the way from Cleveland State University in Ohio. Uh, he is a professor of communication in the School of Communication but his, his knowledge, his insights are, are always interdisciplinary. I'm sure he'll touch many, many disciplines today. He completed, as I said, his PhD from University of Iowa in 2008. He has published numerous, uh, numerous articles in peer-reviewed communication and political science journals. And he's the author of Making of a Small State that came in 2014 from uh, uh, Black Swan, right? Uh, and, uh, it's based, yes. and it's based on his, his work, his uh, his scholarship, his insights on the making of the Uttarakhand state in North India, in Himalayan state Uttarakhand. That was his book and many, many articles and many, many uh, things that he's been doing over the years. He's now the president of the Senate at Cleveland State University. Prior to joining academia, he proudly says he was a journalist and before, and also an environmental activist and before that a chemist. So you see all his, his range of uh, disciplines and experiences. Welcome, Anup. All yours. Stage is yours. Please welcome. Please join. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Pankaj, for uh, for this invitation. Uh, and, you know, I was I was sort of pushing it off a long, long time, and you know, persistent has eventually kind of given me this opportunity. To, to be here. Yes. I have I have uh, watched uh, previous. Um, series and you know, previous speakers on this series, and that has been very enlightening. Uh, I find this series very fascinating, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, I um, today, the you must have seen that uh, one of the things that I've been always grappling with uh, is uh, I'm a social scientist. I take a very social scientific approach in my in my own research. Uh, and uh, but my reading is goes is very wide, and so um, I often I've always wondered about it because this we face in political social science a lot uh, is this context dependent theorization and context free theorization, which is uh, sometimes I also think of it as an envy of hard sciences because hard sciences have universal theorization. And so that is what is an idea which I'm continuously grappling with myself, you know, because I see the value I'm, as Pankaj mentioned in my introduction, my, uh, I was a chemist. So I was trained initially in the epistemology of art sciences. And so uh, I was lucky to be at Iowa where I was trained under some of the best people in cultural critical tradition. And so that hasn't uh, had broadened my horizon. So uh, just to begin with, uh, one of the essays that has always fascinated me, and I've gone back to that essay again and again, is by A.K. Ramanujam, Is There an Indian Way of Thinking? And uh, I was introduced to this essay at Iowa, and I had read it then, and then since then I've read it again and again. And um, the, the, the subject position of, the, of Ramanujam himself, and how he talks about his father, uh, which inspired that essay that he was trying to understand his father as a mathematician. His father was a mathematician and also an astrologer. And like most people of his father's generation, uh, he was, um, you know, in a typical sense, he was a hybrid and he would, he would dress traditionally, but also with Western clothes and all that. And he was always confounded. Ramanujan was confounded. That's what you read in that essay. You, that's the reading you get from the essay. That he was confounded. That why is his father, a mathematician who knows the modern rigor of mathematics, the paradigm of mathematical proof, and still practices astrology? And, and so 
he was he asked himself this question uh, that inspired him that is it possible to move beyond mere description and thinking uh, in an Indian way? And uh, he doesn't have a definite answer in the in the essay, but he kind of alludes to that in the present, that in his contemporary time, uh, he thought that there was all that Indian scholarship could offer was description, not thinking, not analytical thinking. And then he, you see it as a subtext in that essay that where he goes on and he tries to explain why he thinks so. So he formulates this question in multiple ways, emphasizing on one word or the other. Uh, so the broad question is, is there, and is, is the emphasis, is there an Indian way of thinking? And then he moves from there to saying, is there an Indian way of thinking? That means there is one particular way. And, and then he says, is there an Indian where he even questions the very notion of Indian as, as a category? And then he, he moves from there to the final question, thinking itself, what is thinking? Right? And if there is something thinking, then what exactly is this? Uh, Ramanujam is very clear that, yes, there was an Indian way of thinking. So in the present, he is uh, he doesn't think it exists anymore, but he's thought that there was an Indian way of thinking. And that Indian way of thinking was lost because of the way the colonial education system worked, the way the society moved forward and as a result of colonization. And uh, it didn't exist, it doesn't exist anymore. And, uh, and in, in that, obviously, when he was saying all that, he was, he was, he, he was not being specific to social sciences or humanities or, or sciences. He was, he was making a very broad sweeping comment about that. And uh, when he said there was, he would, he would go back to the past and Vedic tradition and other traditions in the in Indian knowledge systems. And he would say that, yes, there was one and we have lost that in some sense. And so, and his, his conclusion was also, there's no, there's nothing to go back to, you know, we don't need to recover it. It wasn't that he was saying that we need to recover that. Uh, and, and so again, this is my reading. We can have multiple readings of Ramanujam in different ways. Uh, and, and so as far as the Indian was itself, he thought that the term Indian is, is also a very modern construct. Um, there's nothing called, you know, it didn't exist um, prior to colonization, British colonization. And um, there are different way, views on it. People would think that, you know, yes, there was a Hindustan, it's just a nomenclature change. And others would say Hindustan itself is a nomenclature change to Bharat. And so you, you see these kinds of debates in popular press all the time. And uh, about this, this is a very contested terrain that where, whether India, India exists before uh, British colonization. And so what happens is this, that he, he buys into that. He says, yes, India doesn't exist. So he's, you can see it very well that he has that position. And then from there, he, he, he do, does conclude that there isn't one particular way of Indian thinking, even if it existed in the past. And that goes to the diversity of traditions in India, diversity of in, in ontologies and epistemologies in traditional systems of knowledge in India. And so he says that there isn't one particular way, there are multiple ways. And that, those multiple ways, those diverse ways, uh, uh, are not only as a result of what has come from India, but all the territory which we call the subcontinent of India. Yeah, it has also come from, you know, people have brought in traditions within it. And uh, this is, um, he doesn't question the status of old knowledge. He says that there is a lot of remarkable knowledge in, in the past. It's not that there isn't. Although uh, when we look at it from the point of view of um, you know, scientific knowledge or mathematical knowledge and these kinds of things, again, it becomes a very terrain of contestation among scholars, uh, especially Indologists who saw very advanced mathematics or something in, in an ancient text were quick to reject it as saying it was borrowed from Greeks, Romans or Arabs or somewhere else. And one of the reasons that they say that is because they don't have the logical deductions in there. And so, because these are just conclusions, uh, but that should remind us of another Ramanujan, the mathematician, who was similarly, you know, Hardy was very perplexed, his mentor in uh, that, G.H. Hardy, his mentor was perplexed that he would just give him conclusions and there was no proof 
there was no, no set of deductions that he would provide. But how did he arrive at those conclusions? And so uh, that's the way that it was difficult for him to grapple that Indian way of presenting knowledge. Uh, and uh, so Indologists generally, when they saw something very advanced mathematical knowledge, they would just go ahead and say, reject, uh, say it was borrowed because they didn't want those deductions. So although we know that in mathematical knowledge, there was a very advanced computational science available at the time, both in terms of, um, you know, which they was divided into Ganit and Falit, which are, uh, which are very sophisticated computations. Uh, and um, if you can think that these people would knew all that and they were doing it, so there must be some underlying, um, you know, deduction, deductive method uh, to arrive at that kind of uh, knowledge. So, at the end of the essay, what you read from it is that you come to this conclusion that he's, he is almost saying that a cognitive process that leads us to theory, which I'm not quoting him, this is my interpretation, a cognitive process that leads us to theory, which helps understand and explain with a capacity for discrimination, categorization, abstraction, and generalization, doesn't exist in a unique Indian way. So these things are now mostly what we have learned from the Western knowledge systems uh, and under the Western education system. And so he says that it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that he says that it doesn't exist in the past. He just says it doesn't exist in the present. This essay was published in 1989. So it was, uh, he didn't, it was published much later. It was published in Journal of Contemporary Sociology, Indian Sociology. And so, it is an essay that is is a remarkable essay, and it is it is something that we should be um, uh, uh, students should read it. All students who uh, should read it, and uh, you know, I am I, I see myself mostly often in my professional capacity as a teacher. I read a lot. I tell my students to read all kinds of things. I don't know whether to read it or not. But so, if you look at it from the context of the larger debate um, on knowledge, uh, you know, uh, uh, across. West and the East, or you can see that there was a movement for decolonization of knowledge systems. Uh, and, uh, you know, it started with the post structuralist, post modern suspicion of meta narratives, and uh, absolute nature of truth was questioned, uh, objectivity versus intersubjectivity in knowledge systems. That was um, how, to, how can we, you know, uh, is, is there an absolute truth or is there an objective truth? Uh, those were questioned under this, this paradigm, post-structuralist paradigm. And uh, the general conclusion of that was that um, theory or universal application of theory is not possible. Theory has to be context dependent, especially in the field of social sciences and humanities. Uh, and so context dependent inquiry even though context-dependent inquiry is incapable of offering universal theories that could be applied across space and time, uh, there is no way of escaping it. And so um, the, the basic assumption of uh, the paradigm of context-free uh, universal theory that there is possibility to arrive at truth statements, justification, absolute justification, is possible was put into question. In addition to that, there was also this whole notion of you know challenging it from the point of view of the politics, international politics of knowledge. And uh, if somebody says it doesn't exist, that's that's ridiculous. So uh, so what happened is this: that um, how do you ensure that there could be? How do how do we? If, is, is there even a need to bring back some Indian way of thinking? So my, my reading of this through my own work uh, that I do, uh, much of my current work is very empirical, very quantitative, statistical, but um, my earlier work is mostly critical, qualitative, ethnographic. And so I have come to this conclusion that there is a need for context-dependent theorization, but it doesn't, uh, and theory building. And so there is a value in that. And I will, in later in my in my talk, I'll come back to it by uh, using my own work as an example. Uh, and so, but 
let's briefly go back and try to think in terms of what is decolonizing of thinking. How do we do that first? First thing is that you cannot uh, move ahead unless you understand the process of decolonizing. And that's what I've been trying for a very long time, thinking about it. Uh, so if you look at it, you know, I for me, the most seminal text in decolonizing thinking is Chino Achebe's Things Fall Apart. Uh, it is, it also in some ways is seen to be a seminal text for launching of the postmodern movement. And um, then uh, there, is, there is another fiction work which doesn't get talked about a lot, is Season of Migration to the North. And, and both these works uh, tell us uh, if they are fictions, but there are, there are insights in it which, which suggest how an entire knowledge system was, was destroyed as a result of colonization. And, and we see that subtext even in Midnight's Children of Salman Rushdie. Uh, and uh, then there are a couple of book, uh, landmark books in, in on India colonial education system. One is The Beautiful Tree by Dharampal. Another is The Mask of Conquest by Vishwanath, Gauri Vishwanathan. And if you read through that, you can see how, you know, this new whole system was created as a result of destruction of a previous existing system. So there is a break and that continuity doesn't exist. And so because of that break, there is this anxiety that, uh, that Ramanujan saw in his father. And you can see that you know, this confoundedness that he, he sees that. You, you also have new meta-narratives like that of Said Orientalism, which, which itself is, um, you know, although I don't see it of much value to as a social scientist for us, uh, uh, for me as a social scientist, because it's mostly on, you know, it's value, it's value lies in sentiments and consciousness. If you look at that from that point of view, uh, how colonialism impacted, um, you know, representation of non-West. But a much more important book that I think is, uh, which often for a social scientist gets ignored, which has inspired me and for how I'm thinking about it, is uh, Samir Amin's Eurocentrism. Samir Amin was an economist from Egypt. Uh, after studying in France, he went back to Egypt. He lived all his life in Egypt. And... Um, you can see that, you know, uh, the difference when you, if you read the two texts, Orientalism and Euro, Eurocentrism published one year apart, you know, uh, in, in translation, uh, Samir Amin's original work is in Arabic, whereas Said's original uh, work is in English. You can see that um, Said is actually within the Western academia. He's in the Western academia and he's talking in the language of his colleagues and in the paradigm of his colleagues in Western Arcadia. And so, uh, but Samir Amin, who all his life worked in Egypt and who coined the term Eurocentrism, uh, was a social scientist. He, you can see that coming from him, that how he could see that this break in continuity from the past is, uh, is leads, to, uh, leads to theorizing the non-West in a way which is not really productive or helpful. It's largely, you know, imposing an alien framework into these non-Western societies. And as economist, he was he was very much involved in policy building in Egypt, and he, he could see that. And so he uh, was trying all his life to to move it. That how is it possible that we can end the hegemony of the European characteristics of rational inquiry? So he was not denying rational inquiry, but he was saying, how do you remove that European characteristic of rational inquiry in social theory? How do you do that? And that was his struggle. In the process, you know, at the same time, you have all this movement going forward. People who are reading these works, they are formulating their own ideas based on that uh, and trying to offer an alternative. Uh, what is that alternative? That alternative is that is it possible to have both or not only an alternative modernity, an alternative way of rational having a rational inquiry, and at the same time, is it is it possible for us to our uh, for for scholars in the in the East, in the non-West, to understand their societies and explain their societies and predict outcomes in their societies 
in a way which is much more context dependent of their own societies and without giving up rational inquiry. So it's not like you have to give up rational inquiry, but you should be able to handle ambiguity. Because if you, if you, uh, the, so that's the challenge in a sense for, and, and we all go through, especially I'm also in the Western Academy, uh, but I'm, uh, so I go through that challenge all the way when I study India or write about India or I do my, much of my work in India. Uh, so, so what you see is this, that I, uh, I, I would say that if we want to go back to that, are there examples where people have tried to do that? Scholars have tried to do that from trying to look at it and offered some Indian way of theorizing. So uh, in history, one of the most significant contribution in theorizing of historiography was done by subaltern studies movement. And what you find in that movement is that they were trying to, even though they were, they were influenced by the Neil School in France and they were influenced by Gramsci, uh, but still they were able to, to come up with a very context dependent, culturally rooted historiography. And um, so, for example, one of the seminal texts that I uh, like to go back to all the time, and I would say that, you know, it is, it is, it is something which we need to, you know, it, it, it hasn't received that much of, that much of attention, that particular text from sub, subaltern studies, which is, which is called the mentality of subalternity. Kanta uh, Nama Rajdham, or Rajdham. This particular work is actually trying to, and as a, because I study media and politics, uh, it kind of explains the, in a, in a very culturally rooted way of the political understanding of an ordinary subaltern. How does the, how does the subaltern in India, the peasants during the Zamindari in Bengal, how did they understand the political and how they practice the political in the process? And what you, what you come to it is that there is resistance in that political, but there is also submission. So this, this complex interplay of submission and resistance is found there. So why is there submission if there is resistance? Uh, what you find is that the submission is to the larger body politic. You don't want to you know, throw the baby with the bathwater. Right, so that's the point that they're trying to make. You know, like for example, yes, you protest against the zamindar's oppressions and the you know uh, raising of taxes, or um, but you don't want the zamindar to go away. So you're not really challenging the authority. You you so that part of submission and resistance keeps working in that. It's not revolutionary. So let's say the revolutionary paradigm doesn't exist, and uh, so it's not like you just upset everything and move on, you know, and create new. That, that, that sense of continuity, that sense of, and uh, that there is reform possible, there is reform that is possible through resistance. Um, and, and you see that play of that, uh, that also in, in another essay that, which is an important one, is Origins and Transformation of the Devi, Hardiman's essay uh, in, in that series of Swarton Studies. So here also you see here is a scholar, a non-Indian who is trying to understand it. He's trying to, as an ethnographer's position, trying to understand the subjectivity of uh, the community he's studying and tries to understand the ambiguity from their perspective rather than trying to categorize and discriminate to produce some kind of an objective truth out of it. Uh, and so all these works have provided us a larger framework in which others have also contributed, you know, Dipesh Chakravarti's Provincializing Europe, which um, tries to push the academy to, academy to think in that direction. Uh, and then you have um, the logic of the location of culture, which is by Homi Bhabha, which also deals with ambiguity and interstitial location of uh, cultures in a globalized world. And um, you, uh, at the same time, there are three new books that, that I uh, have been, uh, have read recently, which have also attempted to do that. 
in time in in a way trying to 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 challenge this what I call the hegemony of hegemonic characteristics characteristics of rational inquiry. Uh, uh, in one of them is uh, one of them is uh, is this recently published work book by Novitsky Novits I can't pronounce his name Novitsky uh, the quotidian revolution, which is a is 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 an excellent work which tries to say that to argues for pre modernity evidence for pre modernity in the bhakti movement, uh, and bhakti movement in Maharashtra. And it it is it is saying that how vernacularization was the beginning of pre modernity in India, and uh, and that was not in a sense more uh, was a progress in terms of um, communities who were under the hegemonic hold of the Sanskrit scholarship and tradition. Then there is this. Um, Another new work, which is uh, by Priya Satya, which is called Time's Monster, How History Makes History, in which he questions this whole notion of how uh, time it only moves in one direction, which is in progress, and, and how that notion of history, that history is, is a march towards progress. Um, you know, for example, um, the Barack Obama's famous course, The Arc of Justice Always Bends Towards you know, arc of history bends towards justice. So that sort of progress, the thinking that the time is in, in history is moving towards progress, which she, which basically was an idea proposed, she brings that, that James Mill view of history. And she questions that in a sense that what it had done is this, that it has um, all colonial enterprises was seen in some way, even if gone wrong, was still progress. So, and we see that but that sort of thinking is still now. For example, invasion of Afghanistan or Iraq is, is seen as, you know, oh yeah, it went wrong. It didn't go well, but it was still progress, right? And you would see nitpicking here and there that, oh, we did women emancipation, we did this and this and this, and so we in some way progress that society. So, so that is, uh, she challenges that notion in that book that how uh, this notion of time as moving in one direction and that direction is progress, which goes back to if you look at Indian knowledge systems and you in, in Indian tradition, time is not linear. Time is non-linear, and what does that mean? As time is not linear towards progress, and that gives you some respect for traditions. It says that everything is not wrong in the past. Everything is there is nothing to learn from the past. That's not really true. You know, there's a lot to learn from the past. And, and, and so in a non-linear fashion, when you think about these things, uh, then it is possible to, to, to have an Indian way of theorizing. So to, to, to do an Indian way of theorizing in social sciences, or for that matter, a non-Western way of theorizing in social sciences, uh, you, we, you have to see time as not necessarily one directional and towards progress. The other is you have to think in terms of you know, possibility of ambiguity. You have to think in terms of, you know, intersubjectivity rather than just um, possibility of objective knowledge. And at the same time, you have to think in terms of um, um, a, uh, a context dependent theorization. So the theorization can only be context dependent in social sciences. So, um, and if we look at it from those perspectives, then it is possible for Indian scholarship to be uh, to be able to offer theories and to be able to theorize the social reality of contemporary India. Uh, you, at the same time, uh, this is this is how I I think it doesn't mean you know it's not open to criticism. It's possible. But there's a lot of criticism of that view. Uh, so uh, with this opening section, I'd like to a little bit talk about coming to the, you know, I want to talk about the exemplar that uh, I, want, I want to use to explain that, which is from my own work, which is, which is in the book, Making of a Small State. And one of the core theoretical challenges that I had when, when I was trying to work on that was how do I conceptualize Jan And uh, you know, in graduate school, when 
you propose something like this to study, uh, there's automatic, you know, there is your advisors tell you, hey, there's a lot of literature on social movement theories and that's where you should go and you should look at social movement theories. And I did that. I, I studied social movement theory, took a lot of, you know, from departments in sociology and political science. I studied all that and I tried to start thinking about it in terms of, okay, so how do I apply these theories in the context of Jan Andolan of Uttarakhand? Will these theories, do these theories have the power, the explanatory power to explain what happened in the Janandolan? What is Janandolan and what happened in the Janandolan of that? And I was coming to a, I was coming to this, you know, it's unable to deal with it. You know, this, these theories were unable to deal with it, to, to, to offer me what is, what in social science we call explication. I was unable to explicate in a manner that I could fit the evidence to show what was happening. And, and the, the social movement theories we're talking, there is, there is obviously there is the revolutionary paradigm going back, you know, the revolutionary paradigm, which is a, which is a Marxist notion, or one of the theories which is basically destroying everything and building a new. So the old structures, old social structures needs to be destroyed and new structure needs to be built. And what I find is that Uttarakhand movement was not that. It wasn't a separatist movement. It wasn't a movement which wanted to break away from in India. It wasn't a movement which necessarily was disrespecting of the large state of Uttar Pradesh from which it wanted autonomy. Uh, it shared the linguistic characteristics of the large state of Uttar Pradesh. So that revolutionary paradigm was not very helpful in explaining what was happening in the Uttarakhand movement. So I uh, then looked at certain other approaches, which some of them are very uh, institutionalist approaches, which is social movement organization theories. That, you know, there are social movement organizations, they are funded, these people are members, they are you know, they, they organized, this is their objective, this is their agenda, they want to do. So it studies it from an organization's logic. Organization is created for a purpose, so it has to work for, towards that purpose. But again, Janandolan is not like that. It is not an organization or at least a organization. It has so many other organizations being, becoming part of it. So the, the, the approach of social movement organization was also not very helpful in trying to understand that. And then you had in, in, in social movement theory, the political opportunity structure that when does an organ movement break? You know, when does a movement reach the tipping point? So there was this idea that when the opportunity, the political opportunity exists, when the elites are divided uh, and political elites are divided, then the window of opportunity opens where this long-standing demand or long-standing political movement can break through and come out in the open. Yeah. It, has, uh, it has part explanatory power that in terms of uh, why the movement happened at the time that it happened. So it explains that to a greater extent that why 1994, this movement really breaks out on the streets, right? Uh, and if you see at that time, the political structure at that time in Uttar Pradesh, um, you know, it's a post mandal world, post mandal politics, and you have a Samajwadi party in power. Uh, Uttarakhand is, um, is primarily a very, you know, is a unique state, not anymore, but at the time, that region of Uttarakhand, Kumaogarwal, it's um, primarily an 80% of our caste region. And so there was an, a, an argument that BJP was exploiting that 80%. You know, they wanted to carve out a space where they had a political future. The BJP had a political future in the process. So this political opportunity structure theory was offering this moment where BJP, because BJP, all the MLAs from this region belong to BJP and rest of the state BJP had very little power and so much other party was in power. So they thought if this gives them that this could be an explanation, they saw an opportunity and so they had galvanized this movement and they created this movement to demand a separate state. So the time part of it is somewhat, uh, as I said, it explains that, but it doesn't really explain uh, 
if you if you if you do when we do when I was doing field work, when you realize that this movement is not 1994 or 1990s, it goes back to early 20th century. There is a long-standing demand. There is a long-standing movement going on, and it is this moment it has emerged as a genre. There are other approaches which really messaging and articulation approaches which are helpful. So uh, like framing how messages, movements frame themselves, how they present themselves. So if you, if you see that I had a challenge that how do I take this to explain, to create an explanatory power for, for how do I theorize it? So, so the main challenge was to theorize John Andolan itself. How do you theorize John Andolan? And uh, if you look at that to that, that theorization, which could help ex explain uh, the mobilization uh, that had happened in 1994. It was a massive mobilization. And so to the, to the extent that in 1994 mobilization, the Jan Andolan resulted in almost in uh, practical terms, the central government and everybody had accepted that Uttarakhand is going to become a state, although it became in 2000, it took its time, it has its own institutional processes to deal with. So when I was trying, so, so this is where it comes down to. So what is a Jan Andolan? So how do, I, how do I try to theorize it? So first thing that, uh, you, you know, it's not like, you know, you, you do a literature and you look in literature, it's not that you, you have some unique idea of your own. There is always a connection with other people's ideas. And Ramchandra Guha in his Unquiet Words has a very small section dedicated to it. Uh, he talks about Tandaks. And he, he talks about Tandak as a form of protest. And what, what you see, and then, you know, I was aware of it in terms of, I also came across this word Dhandak being used all the time. So during Uttarakhand movement, uh, my informants, the people I was interviewing during my research, I would ask them, and they would often substitute the word Janandolan with Dhandak. They would say, oh, it, Uttarakhand Dhandak. So they were doing Dhandak. So what is Dhandak? And then when you start to, you know, peel the layers trying to understand what Dhandak is, and you look at all the examples of Dhandaks, in the past, most of the Tandaks were associated with peasant revolt. And I don't use the word revolt, resistance, basically, as I said, that it's rarely a revolt, it's often a resistance. And so peasant resistance in Uttarakhand. And, and, and there might be similar terms used all across the country for these kinds of traditional forms of protest. So it's a traditional form of protest where people, one of the most important thing of that aspect of that protest is that people gather the, the, the community, the people who are from across different classes and castes, they gather and they ex in, a, in a public space and they express their opposition to some policy of the state or policy of the king at that time, and they demand change. So many of the dhandaks uh, of, um, of the 19th century, late 19th century were around forest rights and they were around, you know, as national, you know, reserve forests were being created because suddenly in the 19th century, the Raja of Garhwal had realized that, you know, there was this immense wealth, natural wealth in terms of, you know, timber and this forest. So one of the things he turns off is monopolizing it. And so he starts practice, the same practice that British had done in the rest of India, declaring reserve forests and monopolizing forest resources. Traditionally, all forests were belong to commun local communities and, and often were in trusteeship held by the devta. So all communities had their own local deities and devtas and it was held by the devta. So these dhandaks were pitching the communities and their devtas against the king. And the king, who was also considered to be in the Sanskritic tradition, Bolanda Badri, that means he was incarnation of, his voice was the voice of Vishnu. So here you have a local deity in contestation with Bolanda Badri, with, this, with the highest hierarchy of Hindu pantheon, somebody who speaks on behalf of Vishnu. So they would protest. Now you can see this dynamics, what was playing out. They're not, it's like, 
it's what you see everywhere in India. There are the, all kinds of gods and devtas and everybody else exists, but nobody challenges, you know, they resist, but they don't say that Vishnu has no primacy of place, right? Everybody accepts the primacy of place of Vishnu in the larger scheme of things and within the local context, they think of primacy of their own devta. And, and so this kind of structure you see here play out. So the protesters are protesting, but they are blaming that, you know, these policies, that new policies on forest were being implemented by the officials of the state of Gadwal, but we are pretty sure that the king is not, king doesn't know that these are wrong policies. And all we need to do is, show up in a public space, make our opposition known to the king. And once the king comes to know about it, the king will change, you know, the policy. And so these series of dhandats take place over forest rights over here. One of them ends up in violence where the local official, uh, you know, shoots the protesters and that's, uh, you know, it's almost seen at a local level equivalent to Janiyawala Bhag of Uttarakhand. And so what, what is the protester demanding here in the dhanda? The dhanda, the protester is going out in the public space. First thing is to claim the public space, you know, come and gather in a place and just sit down, bring their food, camp there, you know, sit there till the king gives an audience. Okay. And the king, in this case, king or somebody from the royal family has to come and give an audience and listen to the grievances. Now, if you see this framework, of Thunder, you can see it in all the protests that even you see it now. So one is the claiming of the public space that you know, these people have to come to the public space, gather there and they have to claim it, you know, occupy it and then seek an audience. And they think that they have a rational, you know, grievance and the king is going to rationally respond to it, the ruler in this case. The other is, for a Jan Andolan to emerge, they have to come as a Jan. And to come as a Jan man that you can't come as a Brahmin, a Kshatriya, or a, you know, your caste identities, or you can't come as a Jan if you are based on your class. So there has to be some way, a collective identity of the Jan created. And Jan is a very interesting term, word. It is, uh, its roots in Sanskrit is, is almost like an antonym of Raj. Raj and Jan. You can see in traditional literature, Janpads and Rajpads, right? So Jan is the other side. It's almost like, you know, the way uh, Habermas has conceptualized the private sphere and the public sphere and, you know, the state sphere. So it is, it is in that context, this is Jan is this, that sphere in which this identity, this identity has to be created. And so most Tandaks, if they didn't, were not able to construct that identity, then they didn't succeed as a Tandak uh, in getting the grievances addressed. And these are only, it's a chipping away process. It's not like suddenly, as I said, it's not a revolution. So there is no revolution. So there's resistance, but there is submission as well to this greater idea. So that's what you find in the Uttarakhand movement. Uttarakhand movement becomes a Jan Andolan where it wants an autonomy for the state, but it's not going to become a separatist movement. And it's not going to, it's not a revolutionary movement. Like for example, it's not a movement uh, like in many other margins of Indian state, especially regions which are distanced from the center like you had in Northeast, or you have in Kashmir, or you have in even in Central India by the Mars. It's not about a revolution. And so none of these are Jan Andolans actually, they are all revolutionary movements on the periphery of India. And so, and that's why they end up in the armed struggles often, and because it's not about, so there is that distinction has to, at that time during the Uttarakhand movement, there was, it doesn't mean there are not groups who want to make it revolutionary but they were very quickly pushed out of the Janandola. So there were people who were trying to say, hey, we need to pick up arms and we are all trained. You know, we have so many people trained in the, uh, in the military because you know, it, the region provides so many soldiers to Indian army. So there were a lot of retired people and most soldiers retired by 35, 40. They were a lot in young age and you can still you know, carry on a big struggle against Indian state. 
But that as soon as somebody would say that, you know, that person would be very quickly pushed to the periphery of the movement. And, and so, because that was revolutionary, and they were talking about a region in the nation rather than a separate nation, or sometimes which is seen in terms of conceptualizing subnationalism. So it's a subnation. So you have this, this Jana Andolan, the cr criteria of space is important, claiming a space, getting a hearing, and then um, being able to construct a Jan, a people, which is somewhat similar to what a populism, left populism does, or for that matter, even right does it. But right, right populism is, is more about excluding some people than creating a people, you know, it's an exclusionary group. Uh, whereas the left is much more putting it all together, you know, trying to construct a bigger identity. So it is, there is there are similarities with Jan Andolan and um, Laclau's framework of populism, Ernesto Laclau's framework of populism. Interestingly, that also his framework emerged from South America. And what he saw in the South America social movements emerging from the, uh, the Indians protesting, you know, I use the term Indians, but let's say natives who are natives to the land of South America who are protesting uh, and seeking more rights. And so these are smaller communities and they are, you know, protesting, trying to demand with the, the states are mostly controlled by European colonialists. So, so what happens is that he, he had theorized it in that context where he had witnessed what was happening in South America. And you, you can see that there also, they were not really signed to, in South America, trying to upset the state. They were not I think, talking about revolution. They were talking about how do we resist and push it in a positive direction for the community. And they would try to construct a people which would include the European settlers as well as natives. And so there are these similarities with that in Jan Andolan. So Jan Andolan, in a way, is, a, is an Indian alternative of populism, a left-wing populism. So are there other examples? If you see, it is, is it only Thandak, which happens in Trakhan, which is, which is this big example of a Jan you know, traditional form of protest, which comes together as a Jan Andolan. Uh, you find that in most, uh, even early Gandhian struggles. So for example, if you look at, so you find that, as I said, in the subalternity of, that you see in uh, subaltern studies project, all the protests that they have studied, you would see that they were riots, riot led andolans against the Zamindars or the British. You could see the same, same dynamics playing out. And even Gandhi, when he starts his first real big protest in India, which is the Champaran Jan Andolan against um, cultivation of indigo in Bihar, you find the same thing over there. What happens is this, that these are people who are getting together. They are not trying to just take over the land and remove all those British zamindars or European zamindars who, who forced them to cultivate right. Neil. They were resisting and demanding change in the in that and they were reminding freedom from being forced to cultivate indigo when especially when they had small plot of land on which they could have grown rice for themselves and and so when they were protesting and you see that dynamics over there this, this was an this was an you know local indigenous movement it's not like gandhi created it these people went to gandhi for leadership and they invited him to lead the movement and so there was already happening over there and it has the all the characteristics of what you call what in Uttarakhand people call Dhanda. And so Dhanda is happening. And do you know, it, one, of the, one of the primary goals of that Dhanda, eventually they had, you know, uh, when Gandhi arrives there, and Rajendra Prasad, who later on becomes president of India, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, he is the local, uh, you know, he's a lawyer and he's, lead, he's coordinating that movement over there. He starts conduct, carrying out signature campaigns and collecting testimonies from farmers, right? So why is he collecting all these testimonies? They were all started collecting testimonies in years in advance, a year in advance, because they knew that a representative of the British royal family, the prince, was going to visit Nepal. Was going to come to India. Was going to visit Nepal, and when he would be going to Nepal, he'll go through Champar. 
or he'll go in company and he'll have to come to North Bihar. And their entire goal was to appear in front of him and make present this, you know, this, these testimonies. And it was like, oh, if we get the audience of the king, the king would see that what his officials were doing on the ground was wrong and would change. You can see this incremental approach in Gandhi's later struggles. What he sees, he, Gandhi is not really the grand strategist in Champaran. He's a grand, he is the best student of Champaran. He's studying it. He's looking at it and seeing how the dynamics is. And that is why it, it's, it's a firm belief that he has about incremental, which also he comes from South Africa, where he saw that his incremental approach over there, how he was using in terms of it is. And so you have that example that there are these, these how something becomes. So now to be, make it these protests, these dhandaks, to make it like in Champaran, to make it Jana Andolan, the second aspect, as I said, is about how to create the Jana is important. You see that incremental approach in the Namak Satyagra, where you are incrementally breaking the law, it's much more symbolic, and you're expecting the British to see, and eventually British withdraw that law. You see that in Chipko movement. Uh, you see that in, like in the Chipko, is thought to be that it was it was against ban on felling of trees. No, it wasn't about ban on felling of trees. These communities wanted a much more sustainable way of using forest resources. And their view was that if you give these contractors, bring these forest contractors from the plains and they would indiscriminately cut the trees, that would lead to an ecological disaster. And that's what they connect with the Alaknanda floods in the Alaknanda River. So you have this idea over here that they are, in Chipko as well, they recognize, yes, timber is needed. Yes, we have local industry. Yes, we need the tim timber for constructing our homes. It's not like we are asking for ban. But what actually happens is this, that the movement, often more, many Jan Andolans get co-opted. Uttarakhand Andolan eventually gets co-opted. So like Chipko gets co-opted. And what results from is this legislation which puts a ban on federal trees, right? which goes against community, traditional forest dwellers and their community rights. They wanted a sustainable use of the forest. They didn't want a total ban, right? But the environmentalist movement globally, we see the same thing. You know, don't touch the trees, don't touch, cut the brush, that sort of thing, where what really what you need, needed was a sustainable way of managing the wilderness and the forest. Well, in India, most of it is not wilderness. It's still just forest because communities live everywhere. You see that same thing in the JP Andolan, which lasts for some time and after in the post-emergency. What JP does is creates a Jan Andolan. It creates that big, you know, unified Jan against Indira Gandhi's emergency. And this Jan has people from different ideological streams, different classes, castes, all communities are part of it. Muslims, Hindus, upper caste, lower caste, all kinds of people are part of this movement. And there are people from the left, the people from the right. Uh, uh, and when I say left, I don't mean the Communist Party because it's a revolutionary thought uh, ideology. So that's, well, it, it cannot join it. So you have this example over there in JP's Janandola. If you want to interpret that, this is, I, I started seeing some value in this whole framework of Janandola, that this is a theory which might not be relevant for us to do for the West or theorizing a feminist movement or a green movement in Europe, in Germany, or it would not be good in theorizing, um, you know, even Occupy Wall Street is somewhat similar to it, but, you know, still not to the perfect. Uh, so, but it is very good in explaining these non-Western societies uh, where these protest movements emerge and eventually become a big uh, large scale mobilization, popular mobilization. And so you can, you, you this framework, I start seeing that it has a lot of value in applying it to a lot of different 
other movements, Baba tickets, which I witnessed, uh, uh, the original farmers movement back in 80s, Main Singh tickets, uh, you can see that it can be applied to the job. Jan, I've written about it, how Jan Lokpal Andolan uh, in 2010-11 was a Jan Andolan. And because it had all these characteristics that I'm, you know, that I've just explicated in what the Jan Andolan can is, you can see it in the Lokpal Jan Andolan. Uh, like all social movements, Jan Andolans also get institutionalized and get co-opted. So we see that institutionalization, co-optation in our, you know, Amadi Party is a political party which has institutionalized and co-opted the sentiments around the Jan Andolan, Lokpal Andolan. But in some Andolans in recent times have failed to emerge as a Jan Andolan. Uh, they have remained protests, but, but you know, they are dandaks, there's no doubt, but they are unable to rise from Tandak to a Jan Andolan. Like for example, the anti-CA protest. The anti-CA protest um, was unable to create what we call a jam around it. And uh, it did try to do one thing, which was claiming the public space, but when it tried to claim the public space, which is occupying those, you know, blocking roads and all that and occupying those places. It did create that, but that Ajan Andolan is not about occupying thoroughfares and roads and all that. It, occupy, it's, it just has to occupy a public space to be seen and heard in the corridors of power. So it's not really, if you would you rarely see a Jan Andolan, a good a Jan Andolan event is not trying to obstruct other people's lives in the process, right? If you do that, then you lose support and you are unable to construct a job because there will be people who want to go for the job, for their daily routine, their work, and their traffic is blocked or the street is blocked. Uh, they won't like that. And so you won't really be able to construct the job. To construct the job, you need to cut across difference, social difference. If you cannot cut across social difference and construct that collective identity of a job, it doesn't succeed. So it remains an initial stage of a thunder. And that also, it doesn't succeed because it, what it does is even though it demands a genuine, it's sentiments that it expresses a genuine, but because it's, it, it's not really asking for an audience with, with the government, which is an essential aspect of Janandola, that there is a solution here. We can sit down, you can hear. The purpose of the Janandola is to be seen and heard, in the corridors of power once they are seen and heard and then there is talks and then they can hear and then they can accept you know there will be a solution and it's an incremental approach so that doesn't happen because because the protesters sitting at anti-ca protests don't want to talk because they for them the government is illegitimate and so it's not even there isn't even an opportunity to have a conversation they they, they just want the law to be withdrawn, right? That's revolutionary insight, you know, which is basically impulse, revolutionary impulse. We don't want to just, we just want to destroy this, what have you just created? Because we think it's unfair. And it might, it could be unfair, you know, there are different perspectives, people compete on those ideas, whether it's unfair or not, but it is, you know, you, you can't see the CA divorced from the legacy of the subcontinent's partitions and other, and other things. So, there is, um, in recent time, there is this Kisan Andolan which emerged. Uh, farmers protest uh, outskirts of Delhi. Again, what it had was um, a lot of people were thinking that, okay, this might, you know, Kisan Andolan, it did succeed in forcing the government to remove the law. It had its revolutionary pulse and it it succeeded in forcing the government to withdraw the, withdraw the law. So, some these revolutionary impulse can succeed, you know, but it was alien to the culture of protest, traditional protest. You would not saw the want the withdrawal of the law, but you would want whatever you suspect is wrong in the law to be changed. But why? Because there was this was it was there is a it it was overlapping with a political contestation with BJP by its opposition, so there was a little bit complication of it which later on Yogendra Adav says that we created the field for Samajwadi party to win the election in UP, but they did not, you know, this Kisan Andolan had laid the field. So I would, uh, 
I think I'm out of time uh, um, here. And so let's, um, I just reiterate what a Janandolan is, certain aspects that it has to have horizontal communication. It has to cut across multiple issues and demands to create a Jan. It has to, um, it has to, uh, cut across social difference. It, to create the jan, it has to claim a public space to be seen and heard in the corridors of power. And that's what makes a successful jan andolan. It has to be incremental in its demand. At this other aspect, a jan andolan is when it, uh, when it fails, is when it fails to create a jan or it fails to articulate equivalence across issues and demands and across social difference. And when it fails to check its anarchist imp impulse, which is revolutionary in nature. It's about destruction, not incremental. And it, like all social movements, even a Janandolan eventually gets co-opted and institutionalized. So that's the other other aspect of it. So I'll, I'll I will conclude here, and um, I would um, hand it over to uh, Dr. Thank you, Anup. Uh, I think we all learned. A lot of new ideas, new uh, insights on Uttarakhand and Jan Andolan uh, in general. I guess time to invite uh, questions. Uh, so all of us now can unmute and ask any questions to Professor Anup Kumar directly, or also type here in the chat window. It's up to you. So I invite questions now from all the participants. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Who's, uh... Pankaj, could you Namaste. monitor the text messages because yes, while I'm looking sure. at it. Yes, yes. Right. Indrani, I think you uh, have a question? Yes. Yes, Namaste, yes. yes. Um, thanks for the lovely, the lovely talk. I, I have an interest in um I want to know the Indian response, Indian way of thinking to respond like Gandhi could have done it in my estimation because he used certain cultural motifs for the society that that really um, got the people moving and uh, professor was talking about the leftist um, organization and um, I don't know how indigenous that is maybe you could explain how indigenous that is to India because one finds those kinds of movements have global um, uh, control. Uh, but basically, uh, like even with Aurobindo, um, how do you get Indians to, to begin to think in that collective way to move forward? Is it necessarily linked to cultural motives? Yeah, thank you, Indrani, for that. I think I made any and, sense. Yeah, thank you, Indrani, for that question. Um, yeah. Gandhi did use um, Indian motives, symbols. Symbols matter, you know, and metaphors matter. How you you going to use in a in an andolan, or even an Indian way of thinking? Uh, but uh, you can also see that Gandhi is a hybridization person. He hybrid, you know, he creates a whole hy hybrid framework where he gets inspired from what he sees in the West and he sees in India and he kind of. But this experience of Champaran really changes him. In significant way, when he when he goes to Champaran and he sees the Janandolan of against you know of Champaran, that's really the formative experience of his, and that's also the reason why he was so upset at Chauri Chora because Chauri Chora ended up in what is called the revolutionary impulse, which is destruction, right? So you burn the police station, and he's not really. It's not just violence, non-violence dichotomy that he's dealing with. He is incremental, and he is unable to deal, you know, he doesn't agree with this kind of revolutionary approach. In some sense, he is Burkean conservative. So you can see that he has this, this impulse, which in the West, you know, in the conservative, traditional conservative movement of the West, you have this Edmund Burke's approach, which is critique of French Revolution. And so at the same time, you have this Gandhi, this framework, this thinking, which is about um, at the, the acceptance, as I said, this framework of resistance and submission Submission to the greater unity is always there. Unity, and it, to the, in the context of what Indran in you are asking, is greater unity of India, greater unity of Indian identity, you know, uh, and, and it's diverse. This greater unity of this diverse identity that we have, accepting that it's that's the first 
premise on which the thinking works. And, and I'm talking about thinking in the domain of you know, so, social sciences, politics. Um, so, so it's a very good question, but 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 at the point we have to think in terms of those categories of thinking. You know what, how how the thinking is taking place beyond metaphors and beyond you know symbols. Thank you. Thank you. You are mute, uh, Pankaj. Sorry, Professor Frederick Smith was I think next in raising his hand. So, hi, Fre Fred. Fred Hello. is also my guru from Iowa, so I <laughs> give him my pranam. But one one learns more from one's students than from uh, one's gurus. <laughs> and um, I, my question is really, I, I, I appreciated the, you know, I, I read your book and I appreciated what you what you said in it. But I wonder if your perspective has changed in the last decade or so since the ascendancy of the of the BJP on a national level and the much more open kind of uh, anti-Islamic sentiment that you find throughout South Asia that you didn't find before, kind of like the open racism you find in the US now that you didn't find like seven years ago. I just wonder whether the whether the whole notion of a Jan Andolan has been colored by the current kind of majoritarian political stance. Uh, yes, you have you identified uh, one of the biggest problems that we are facing in India at this moment, and in some ways, uh, it is also uh, the Achilles' heel of Indian way of thinking, which is that it is unable to construct this notion of Jan, which includes Muslims as well. You know, this constructive identity, this collective identity in the domain of politics and social and civic movements, this inclusiveness of including the Muslims, which is which is not, you know, it's a large minority, you know, it's not, but even if there is a small minority, you would not want to exclude them. What is the problem? Why is it not, you know, why people are not noticing it and why people are not noticing this extreme side of BJP, BJP as a political party and it has this extreme fringe, which is, which is basically has strong antipathy and even to bordering hate for Muslims. That that end, how do you ensure that the PJP is not constituted of those people? You know, those people don't come to power. Don't those people don't capture power? How does this? If we say the BJP is Janandola, right? The BJP movement yeah. is a Janandola. It's not a Janandola, as I said, because it's not. It's unable to construct that include that Muslim minority and a lot of other minorities into it. The, but why is it succeeding? Why is it succeeding? It's succeeding because on the other side, you have the revolutionary impulse. You know, the other side is, so, so it's, it's creating an antagonism towards it. It succeeds in doing that. So that's why you can see that for every problem, their answer is nationalism, right? Everybody is an anti-national anti who opposes them. And why does it do that? Because the fodder for it is given by them. <clears throat> and so that becomes a problem in some sense that it's, it, I think it's, if BJP is not able to realize that it's strange, it, it will undo itself very soon. And uh, if the opposition doesn't realize that you know, this resistance and submission to the idea of India, you know, the state itself, it goes along, you know, you can resist, but you can't even give a small room to the other side to say, hey, you are international. That's, it's a very delicate terrain. Op is, is, is traveling in that, you know, is doing that delicate balance at this moment. You can see in its, its political practice very clearly. I guess what I noticed is that you began with Samir Amin, and and now um, we we're ending up with this with this very kind of one sided top down um, disguise of a of a people state. I mean, does this? I guess what I wanted to know, since this is where you went in your talk, has your view of the Janandolan from Uttarakhand, you know, twenty five years ago, has that changed at all? Uh, well, that that 
the Janandolan of Uttarakhand was co-opted. I have said that in my book itself at the end. So mm -hmm. at the end, I, I say that it got co-opted by BJP and the Congress, right? Mm -hmm. And so once co-optation happens, it loses its essential, its essence, its, its core values, right? And that's what had happened. So the, uh, if you look at the, so I conclude my book in a very pessimistic note by in the epilogue talking about this, this whole process of co-optation that has happened. And that happens with most often with social movements as well. So Janandolan framework, the theoretical framework of Janandolan helps us understand that mobilization moment, that how does a mobilization take place of a Jan construction of a Jan of our, and, but it doesn't mean that it's very unstable, it's liminal in nature. And because of its liminality, it is always fragile. It can be very easily co-opted. And we saw that co-optation with BJP who co-opted the Jan Andolan of Uttarakhand and we see the consequences. You have a home in Uttarakhand, you know exactly what I mean, the consequences of how those are. Ideas and ideals of a movement, right? An Andolan has ideas and ideals and those ideas and ideals get destroyed. Once co-opted, they are brushed aside, right? And that's what happened with Uttarakhand as well. That's what happened with Lokpal Andolan as well, to a larger extent. We still see that with Jan Lokpal, once AAP co opts it, the movement, and institutionalizes it in the party called Aam Aadmi Party, you can see that, that how those ideas and ideals are set aside. And so that is the, that is the danger of Jan Andolan. You know? So understanding the Jan Andolan, for me, what is the hopeful part? If we understand it clearly, and we understand the process of cooptation, then we can actually, people who participate in Jan Andolans, can be careful of it. You know, how do you ensure that a Janandolan doesn't get co-opted? Its ideas and ideals don't get co-opted. We see the same thing in Egypt. I was studying the Egypt's revolution, January 26th revolution with a colleague of a couple of colleagues of mine from Egypt. And we see the same thing. Initial upsurge was almost similar to a Janandolan on Tahrir Square. But eventually it gets co-opted. And once it gets co-opted, its ideas and ideals get to. But those ideas and ideals of this mobilization can survive, it doesn't mean they vanish, they still exist. It is, it is for us scholars who study social movements or study, study societies to, to, to highlight them, to bring it up forefront so that people can see that these were the ideas and ideals of the movement. So that the parties and institutions that co-opt it and present it in a different way don't succeed. So it's a, it's, that's the contribution of a social scientist. If a social scientist is studying a phenomena, what do you contribute to the society at the end after explaining the phenomena? So you can show up the dangers of it. What, what happens with the cooperation? Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. And next we have Dr. Tarani Avasti, my new colleague here at Fame University. Tarani, unmute yourself, yeah. Thank you also for returning me to Ramanujan. It had been too long. Um, I was wondering if I, there were, I, I need this small clarification. So we started out with thinking about the Indian way of thinking and um, find ways, finding ways of theorizing that a non-Eurocentric was, and I suppose in some ways continues to be um, important to my work also. But there's two things there, right? One is to, I, we, we talked at the beginning um, about how Ramanujan speaks of uh, whether an Indian way of thinking can be theory or whether it can just be an object of study. Um, in your study of the Janan Bolan, you talk extensively about how you found certain um, characteristics in there which seemed distinct from uh, the way in which social movements are generally studied uh, within a kind of, um, within the social scientific framework. Um, how is it, do you think, but even in that, the I, the ideas and ideology of the movements that you worked on um, were still an object to study. In what ways do you think um, can they be made to do the work of theory, and whether do you th whether you think they can be made to do the work of theory? Uh, thank you, Tarini. That's that that's that's the challenge that I said that right from the beginning. What Ramanujan's conclusion was that it's not just object of study, it can, what he said that Indians can only be descriptive. They can't be analytical and they can't have explanatory power in their analysis. And so what is the purpose of a theory? Why does theory exist? 
the purpose of theory exists theory exists to actually provide an explanatory has to have an explanatory power if it doesn't have an explanatory power then it's not really a theory okay often a lot of people you term theories things i'm a social scientist i come from social science perspective it has to have explanatory power to be a theory and so that was that's where ramanujam when he says that they can't think they can describe right that indian can describe but not think so it's descriptive in nature but not thinking and so that thinking part is that analytical theory which can be have its maturity and that's where after noticing the explication has this idea that you have to identify the characteristics of the object you're studying and then see the interlinking connections which can offer you an explanatory power and so i have attempted to try to do that by by explicating what janandolan is by identifying those characteristics in in an album it doesn't mean that it's a perfect solution but that's that's what i'm trying to attempt i had attempted to do that as providing a conceptual framework to with an explanatory power and in one case that means the case i studied i was i think i was successful in explaining the rise of the movement explaining the trajectory of the movement explaining the eventual cooptation of the movement as well so so that is should be a goal at the at the end and so again as i say there there are different paradigms and i'm speaking purely from a social science perspective from a social scientific paradigm and so which is where explanation is very important and uh, in an ex a theory with explanatory power can actually you see a movement arising a janandolan arising you could predict its path you know you could you could not only understand what's happening but you could predict its trajectory so for example i gave you about anti ca i could see its trajectory where it was going you know even though i agreed with it you know i agreed with the sentiment the injustice that they were protesting against but i could see where it was going because it was unable to rise as a jump okay i guess i'll ask a small clarification question so the word that you were uh, pronouncing thunder means coldness right for uh, No, no, oh, no. Resistance. What was that word? It no, like... It's called dhandak. It's not thunder. Oh, it's okay. dhandak. I was trying to and, Google and try to find. And it. and you will find similar terms in many parts of India, similar to dhandak. So where right. it comes from? Like in literally, I mean, etymologically, dhandak means where is it coming from? Yeah, it it has a Sanskritic root. The dhandak means basically it's a equivalent word would be caucus in a tate. You know, in English. Okay. the native american caucus and fred might be able to speak more about it the native american word caucus right mm -hmm. from which the word caucusing has come and caucus has come what was it the natives would gather in a public space in the center of the community and you know shout and you know make themselves heard to prove uh, you establish the legitimacy of a new chief or mm -hmm. to establish the legitimacy of a certain decision that the chief had taken so that is it's almost that same dynamic see here you know the, you, at sub level i could when i was at our i i when i came across this word caucus i started asking where this word come from and then i did some digging and i talked to a lot of people what exactly caucus means this is it it's gathering and you know in a public public faith where everybody can see you in in expressing your view in a very vigorous manner vigor is also important right that's what you see jada dola vigor right and so that you can force the leaders of the tribe to see and that is how they establish the legitimacy of of a leader and that's mm, so so there is that it's dhanda case be i'm looking yeah, for the devnagari word actual word i'm looking for the maybe yeah, this find. is an agri word dhanda case as i said is a very very yeah, uh, it's it's, it's written, which, said, which, you know you are the sanskrit like, and fred is the sanskrit person is it dental d or retroflex d i need to check yeah. maybe i'll check with yeah. fred d later on yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. You could uh, you could let me know that what is the dhatu roop of dhanda and where does yes. it come from? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anything else? I, I, I suspect it's more complicated than that. I suspect it yeah. probably comes from something like like stundi, stundik or something like stundi. Okay. I think really oftentimes the first an S yeah. would be left off, something like that. But yeah. okay, I guess uh, if anything else, I mean, if there is nothing else, then I guess we conclude here. and we meet again next month last tuesday of every month we meet uh, next forthcoming is by uh, professor 
uh, Nirima Shukla Bhatt from Wellesley, one of the next ones. One we have coming from uh, George Phillips, uh, Stephen George, sorry, from UT Austin, Sanskritist, and so I'll announce, I'll send emails and hope to, hope to see you all again. Thank you.